The greatest power you possess is your ability to choose. Join Lowe's more as he reveals how you can begin to maximize that power by exploring yourself on the deepest levels and committing to making lasting and positive changes. Get ready to achieve breakthroughs that will lead to accelerated growth and transformation because you are now tuned in to The Blueprint. Good evening and welcome back to The Blueprint uh, Podcast. Man, you know, it's it's been last week. The last couple of weeks have been so exciting, uh, particularly when they are major events. Uh, I think, you know, two weeks ago, um, I had these special broadcast uh, podcast for uh, the Super Bowl. I had the Super Bowl special two at 2 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. on the Sunday of the Super Bowl. And, and uh, man, I had Aaron Beasley of the Jackson Jacksonville Jaguars and, and played also with the Jets, man. What a wonderful, energetic interview that was. If, if you get a chance, I mean, go back and check that, that uh, podcast out. It's still, you know, it's still on uh, Lowe's more, the blueprint on, on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, check that out, man. Just so much any amazing energy he had and such a delightful person, man. And particularly, you know, it was Super Bowl weekend. I hope you guys enjoyed the Super Bowl and I hope you enjoyed who won the Super Bowl. For me, you know, I was kind of looking for Jalen Hurts to to win for this for Jalen Hurts and for the Philadelphia Eagles. But man, Patrick Mahomes is just amazing. Right. I mean, I wasn't mad. I mean, uh, that that he won. Congratulations to them. And then. Man, last Sunday, man, of course, I, you know, many of you know, I already played, I played in the NBA. And so it was a tremendous pleasure to do a special podcast for the NBA All-Star Game. You know, uh, you know, we had a two o'clock special to 3.30 on last week. I had my good friend and uh, Clay Johnson, who won an NBA championship with the Los Angeles Lakers. Man, just, just amazing, man, to have these brothers on, right? And in one of the, you know, one of our most amazing months, although, you know, I celebrate uh, black history every single day. Right. It's not a day that goes by that I don't celebrate black history, but February has been selected as black history month. And so to have Aaron Beasley and also Clay Johnson on the podcast was just just amazing. And we just seem to be making history all around. I mean, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but uh you know, back in the day, I think I did. I played against, um, you know, Brad Doherty. And of course, I played against Michael Jordan. And, you know, we, we you know, most of us think that, you know, the only thing that some guys can do or that if you are a jock, that's all you could do is play basketball. But I mean, we have really broadened the pers- the spectrum when it comes to uh, what we can do while we're playing basketball. And so, I mean, Brad Doherty uh, this past week won the Daytona 500. It's the first black racing team uh, to win. And uh, Brad Doherty, as you know, played with the Cleveland um, Cavaliers. And then, of course, you know, Michael Jordan uh, now is 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 in not in the motor motorcycle professional motorcycle of, of sport, and also he's in NASCAR too. And uh, has one of the hardest new young African American drivers in the business, and and you know on his team. And man, just I was excited when I saw that. And particularly, this is Black History Month, so everybody ought to be excited uh, that um, that we are we're making such strides. We continue to make strides. But I didn't know if you knew that these two basketball players, um, both from North Carolina uh, in NASCAR, and then one of my good friends uh larry larry woodard is on the board for nascar you know brothers on the board of nascar we moving up yeah we need to keep moving up and more of us need to continue to move up and uh which kind of segues into uh tonight's show and uh you know which we're talking about african-american men and women that are just growing becoming power 
power players in, in, in not only the United States, but in this world. And, and, and so I'm excited to bring you this show tonight um, because this is going to be very special, uh, you know, uh, show tonight. And, and remember, the blueprint is a seed, right? It's like dropping a, a, a or it's a pebble. It's like taking a pebble and dropping it in a pond. And somewhere along the line, you get a ripple effect. Right. And I'm hoping that every time we on and with these special interviews, every time that I'm on. Right. And every guest that I spend time with and we have these wonderful conversations that it's like a pebble in a pond. There's a ripple effect. Now, some of you will see this tonight and be blessed. And some will see you down the road. You will you you pick this up and you will look and you'll be blessed. Somebody's going to say something to you about it. And you're going to get that feeling of the ripple effect, right? That you can start at one place, right? Never think that it's over when it, when, when, when the pebble is dropped because there's always a ripple effect. So um, I'm excited tonight. Um, I'm, I'm going to, you know, really before I start, I usually start out with my book of the week, but before I start out with that, right? Um, <laughs> the person I have on the show is my book of the week and so i want to show you this video and we're going to talk about the book of the week and and many other things and somewhere down in the show i'll uh, add all the other special things that i usually uh i usually present down as we go along so uh let's check out this video right regarding the book of the week for far from home i'm bruce jackson and this is my story. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. 910 Prospect Place is my childhood residence. Down the street is my elementary school, PS 289. At the age of nine, my family and I moved to Manhattan to Amsterdam Housing Projects. We lived in 40 Amsterdam Avenue, and down the back of the projects, our friends and I used to always play basketball, similar to what the little kid is doing today. I'll take a crack at it and see if I still have it. Across the street, I can see the high school that I attended, Martin Luther King Jr. High School. And after high school, I went to Hofstra University and Georgetown Law School. And Microsoft, this place has been home for the past 23 years. This is where all the magic occurs. Major deals are made. My home. Never far from home. I'm Bruce Jackson, and this is my story. Wow, let's welcome welcome to the blueprint. Bruce Jackson. <laughs> What's up, Bruce? Hey Lowe's, how you doing? It's a pleasure to be here with you. <laughs> yes, it is on your podcast. Man, I, I appreciate it, man. Hey, hey, it was man, I enjoyed you. Uh, I think it was last weekend at the library not you know the weekend before you were at the, the library, library. public Absolutely. library and i got a chance to go over there and uh uh see your conversation and talk and interview man i, I was i was excited about it right and of course you can see i got my copy of the book right here i'm, I'm glad you got it this is about yeah. sharing it with the world now yeah I, I, but one thing something's wrong you didn't sign it? I didn't sign it? No, I'll you make didn't. Sure I'll pay a special <laughs> visit and I'll sign it for you when I get back. Oh, from man. I, I appreciate that, man. And, and uh, <laughs> you know, one of, the, <laughs> and, and one of the things I know you was busy that was busy that uh, that uh, Saturday, man. You, you, you was busy. Everybody's like, Bruce, Bruce, Bruce. It's yeah, so it was tough. It was tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was tough. So I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave him no, alone. I'm gonna, I'll get him a little bit later, you know. And, and I'm proud of you, man. Cause, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, you, you, they, most people hear me say often, and one of the reasons why I have a book of the week, right? Every week I, I introduce a book of the week, um, That's great. and. And I introduce a word of the week and I introduce a affirmations because number one, there's nothing more in my estimation. There's nothing more important than reading. 
right? Yep, I would and agree. Uh, yeah, and and falling in love with reading, right? Because that was something I was afraid of when I was as a child. So yeah. it took me a long time to get to the point where, you know, I wasn't afraid to read, right? And my dream of being a professional athlete pushed me to that place. You know, right. I, I always tell people that, you know, we all have our, when we find our niche or we uh, find our gifting, right? Hey, it, you can't do it without the book. You, you got to be able to read. You got to be able to write. You got to be able to do math. I mean, and so it was my my gifting and my dream that pushed me to reading and and i i fell in love with it so i and i know it's the remnant today for particularly african-american men yeah. of how important it is to read and learn to read early you know so you having a book and me being able to share it is you know because i'm i'm trying to combat illiteracy right no and so i appreciate that yeah and and so this is awesome having you an author right and and many and many other things we we, we need to uh, discuss I mean before you wrote your book what was your what was your favorite one of your favorite books you know what I think I probably started reading books I wasn't really interested in reading much myself right I think it was in college and the first book was the autobiography of Malcolm X right and so not only reading it was interesting it kind of motivated me right from that point to take a different direction in my life so no that was that was the start of me actually starting to learn a lot about black history as well which is really the core right because once i learned the great things that we did as a people it's all about lows coming from the community which i come from projects in the city you got to see it to believe it and so I started to see and hear about some of the great things that we did as a people. And I said to myself, if that person can do it, that person is me. So let me start to believe in myself a bit more. Yeah. And, and it's interesting about the autobiography of Malcolm X because and the movie. Right. right. Was <laughs> I, I'm not that, I, you know, it was it was a thought, you know, when you look at the movie or you read the book where he copied every he read copied every word out of the dictionary yep right and so man i'm like malcolm words you know because words make out I, I was just saying this the other day my wife is learning sign language oh interesting right yeah she's learning sign language now and and i realized that she was doing the sign language because she's always wanted me to practice with her like hey Tell me to say a word, you know, <laughs> you know? and I, I think for the first time I did it, we were down in uh, North Carolina and and I was giving us some words, you know, last week. Right. And but, um, you know, which I didn't mind. I didn't mind. You know, sometimes she asked me during the game, you know, hey, baby, you hear me my words. I'm like, the game is on. <laughs> the game's going on. Come on. Yeah. Try to get the game's going on. Going on. Yeah. Going. So she's up. She she should put down there. Practice, practice. Not according to not, not, not according to Allen Iverson. Practice. Yeah, I don't need to practice. <laughs> right, absolutely, there's no need to practice. Yeah, but I realize that words, you know, make sentences, and sentences make, you know, paragraphs, and you know, those paragraphs ultimately turn into what we yep. what we pick up every single day is books. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And th and that there's so is so much to learn in those books. Um, and, you know, but if we can't read those words, you know, so um, and so let's get into, you know, talking a little bit because some of the things I, I've been talking with folks about, about the importance of family, the importance of education, importance of faith. Right. Mm -hmm. And so go back a little bit and talk about you know, because I know that your book is more than just, you know, the family you develop personally. Right. Right. But there are different stages of family that you develop, extended family that you have developed over the years from your your own personal family um, into, you know, the family of, you know, getting into this whole music world 
and then getting into this whole Microsoft world. So right. talk a little bit about growing up, because I, I heard you mention, you know, in the Bronx, you know, and that whole experience. So talk a little bit about that, mom, dad, siblings. Well, well, no, I, I well, I'm low. It's not the Bronx, it's Brooklyn, but I did live in the Bronx at Brooklyn. one point as well. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> but I did live what? in the Bronx at one point. Okay, so Brooklyn, Amsterdam, and Brooklyn. Yeah, I had a lot of family in Brooklyn, man. It was rough back then. Now they uncleaned it up a little bit, but uh, well, they cleaned it up. So I lived in pre gentrified <laughs> Brooklyn and Crown Heights. So no, I lived like, come on. The reality is, I was a kid who grew up in the inner city. Father wasn't around that often, in and out of our lives. My mother had six kids. I was one of six. Uh, she worked in a peanut factory and a glass factory. That certainly wasn't enough to take care of us. So we grew up on public assistance my entire life. Uh, we stayed mm -hmm. in Brooklyn until I was about nine years old. And at that point, we left and we moved to Manhattan, to the public housing, the projects. That's what it's really called, the projects. Mm -hmm. uh, we moved directly across the street from Lincoln Center. And when I was in Brooklyn, I didn't realize I was poor because everyone in Brooklyn was poor in my community. Uh, however, when I moved to Amsterdam Houses across from Lincoln Center, that's when I realized that there's a difference. There are some mm -hmm. people who live a totally different life. And our playground there was Central Park. And Central Park was three blocks away, right? And we had to walk through rich communities to get there. And what I always tell people, and I'm pretty transparent about it when I do interviews now for my book, Blows, a lot of interviewers say, why would you tell all the good and the bad and the ugly of the story? I mean, I didn't rob anyone, I didn't sell drugs, but there are other things I did. I stole things, right? Um, and they said, why would you share that? I said, because I have to gain credibility to my community, right? I can't like cover that up. They have to see me and them and I have to tell them, I understand the life you live because I lived it. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm telling the whole story because I realized society has dealt us a bad hand and I can go back to the projects and see my family in Brooklyn, the Bronx and Manhattan. And it's still the same thing. And you have to ask yourself, well, why is it the same? Um, because and I like to say the system and place continues to work, right? I was, I'm not really supposed to be here with you today as an executive at Microsoft sitting in the office of the vice chairman of the Fortune 5 company. Um, statistically, if you were a gambling man and you saw me as a young kid, you would say, no way. And you would probably be right in most cases because the system's not designed for us to really break out. That's why I think it's important for part of what I'm trying to do is inspire the young people that they can achieve more, but they have to be able to see me as them and see me in them. Right. Mm. As I see wow. myself in them as a 10 year old kid. And then I'm trying to inspire some of us who make it out because we're taught once we make it out not to go back. And that's mm. just further perpetrating the environment. Right. We have to go back. And some of us don't want to really share our story. And I'm trying to encourage us to share it. People who look like you and I, um, because I think it's probably the most incredible weapon we have if we're going to try to inspire the next generation of people. Right. Because, again, mm -hmm. it's all about them being able to see it. If you don't see it, you can't achieve it. Right. So so I think that's what to me is in crucial. It's not about someone being smarter than any other. I don't care what urban area you live in. Or if you take them in that same child and put them in an affluent area, they'll do well. And if you take, I always tell people, if you take a kid from an affluent area and put them in an urban area, they wouldn't do well because it's all about resources and environment, right? And so you have to right. ask yourself, why has society continuously failed to provide us with the resources that's necessary for us to reach our potential? I think we'll get there someday. But I think until we get there, we can't afford to lose another generation of brilliant people who live in the inner city who just don't have the resources to reach their potential. Right. And uh, I think uh, one of the you know, I heard you I heard a couple of interviews you had you had done. You had mentioned that and my yep. mind automatically popped up or uh, popped on uh, trading places. Yep. Right. <laughs> with with Eddie yeah. Murphy, where, you know, they, they they took the rich guy and they took away all his resources. 
Yep. Right. And then he started I didn't think of that one, but you're right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He started to act like, you know, you know, in how a person in poverty would act. Right. right. And then they took the they took the black guy and he took him out that environment and put him in another environment and gave him resource. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. And he started to act like a person who had resources and what to do with it. Absolutely. Know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and so uh you know, I, I it, you know, I look at how, you know, we both uh, grew up in terms of, you know, the struggle of Mount Vernon when I was growing up, the struggle of Brooklyn uh, when you was when you were growing up and living in the projects and, you know, yep. in Mount Vernon. And, you know, my mom, single parent, making it work, mm -hmm. you know, um, but we, you know, I, I used to always hear people say that. There's nothing good that comes out the projects. But when I look around and think about all the right. people who have come out the projects, mm -hmm. you know, that have become police officers and mayors and doctors and lawyers. Yeah. I mean, it was just the opportunity, um, you know, to to get an education and, and find yourself in another place. But uh, and so when when uh, you when you were thinking about as a young person growing up in that particular situation ed educationally right um I, i'm sure your mom like my mom was very uh critical in that but going to school in in in, in brooklyn and doing doing your thing um what was your aspirations what what was your what were you dreaming about then i, I have to know, be quite as, honest as with you. I, I have to be honest with you i think that it was just living for the moment at that point right it didn't really click in my life into much later. It was about trying to make money, right? Um, and what I did, and I tell people it was a hard, it was a bad decision academically. I went to Martin Luther King Jr. High School as you saw in the introduction. And so mm -hmm. I attended that school, but I attended a co-op program in that school, which is when you work one week, go to school one week. And I kind of did that to stay off the streets from doing the drugs or the other activities that people were doing. So a great decision. From that standpoint and i always tell people but a horrible decision academically because just mm. think for a moment i made a decision on my own at 14 that i was going to go essentially to school part-time so i can just make money and it was a bad school at that so when it came time to go to college i wasn't ready right but I, nonetheless i applied to what was a high education opportunity program, which was a program for kids who were academically and economically disadvantaged. And I attended that summer. And after two weeks, I wanted to quit because I it was it was painful. Um, mm. And I called my mother and I tell people all the time, don't look at my mother negatively. I just said, Mom, I can't do it. And she said, if you're in that much pain, come home. This is my mother saw me in pain and she didn't want her little boy to be in pain. Right. But I, there's always somebody else you call that tells you that you can't come home, <laughs> right? There's always yeah. someone, and it happens to be my aunt Bertha. I like to call her, and her response to me was like simply, "Bruce, you, I heard you want to come home." I said, "Yeah." She said, uh, "You want to go back to the projects, Amsterdam houses?" I said, "I don't know, maybe." She said, "Do you want to go back and work in a part-time job in the basement making copies?" I said, "Maybe," and she paused, and then she ultimately said. You're not coming home. And she said, because your grandmother took care of people's houses all her life, couldn't look white folks in the face and pick cotton. Your mother picked cotton in the South, couldn't look white folks in the first face and had to address them. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. And so did I. But more importantly, no one in the Jackson family ever graduated from college, not just your generation. And she hung up. And I tell people when she hung up, that just, I realized at that point it wasn't about me because it was just sometimes you can be motivated and it doesn't have to be self motivation, right? My motivation at that point was it was bigger than me because if it was mm. about me, I would have quit. But it was, about, <laughs> yeah. it was about all the past generation of suffering and pain in my family and helping, having a purpose to make sure that I can inspire the next generation to do better. That kind of carried me along the way. And that's the motivation that I use. And I would like to say I never thought about quitting any other time in any other journey I had, but that wouldn't be true. 
I just drew back on that conversation and realized statistically I shouldn't be here, but there's a reason, there's a purpose for me to be here, right? Mm. Um, and that purpose is far beyond statistics and people, right? right. Um, I used to say that I was lucky, but then I started thinking, I said, not too many people have made it out. None of my friends graduate. So it's not luck. And I kind of mm -hmm. changed that whole narrative to say, you know what? Even when I have interviews, they said, you were lucky to get over this hurdle. And I'm like, no, I wasn't lucky. I was blessed. And, and they don't know what to say <laughs> about that. They're like, God, we're, trying to, we're saying you were lucky to really crack through. I'm like, no, I was blessed. There's no other way to explain it. It's not luck. Because a lot of people right. really got lucky and got out of my environment, but they didn't. So I'm blessed for a reason. And that reason, I think, is really to try to inspire other people to do better. Yeah. And that is interesting because, I, you know, people hear me say this all the time. Uh, when I was a little kid, you know, my grandfather used to say, come here, boy, I got a nugget for you. Right. And I'm <laughs> I, I go, you know, I go over to him man, and I'm looking at his hand and stuff like that. He said, I want to tell you something. You know, <laughs> I'm looking for the <laughs> I'm looking for the nugget, right? You know, but right. you just you just gave one there, purpose, mm -hmm. right? And and I I'm I'm hoping that parents or whoever's listening right now, because I mean Bruce just said something that was so powerful that um, you know, young people today, I think. Uh, just take their what what's happening to them right now for granted, you know, mm -hmm. and, and particularly that their mom and dad has, you know, who have grew up in uh, projects, who, who grew up in the inner cities and who've made it out. Right. And you don't know what that is. I mean, you literally don't know what it is to live in that projects or go through that experience and you grow up man not knowing any of that yep. right and and right now you take that for granted right and that you said something that was very powerful that there was something bigger than you the, the, the situation was bigger than you you know and um you know and your aunt gave that to you you know she gave you that nugget man and that you know look at the history look at the look at the struggle Right. Yep. And then, you know, hanging up the phone, man, you that's that's crazy because now you sitting there like, oh, shoot, I got to make a choice. Right. <laughs> How do I respond? To that? <laughs> <laughs> How do I respond to that? Oh, uh, yeah. And, you know, it's it's easy to, you know, it's easy because we we've been we were living in this environment forever. And, and I've seen right. it time after time, you know, with young people that I've dealt with it at the Boys and Girls Club. Who who worked hard, eventually graduated from from high school, and then went on to college, and then last passed the first semester of the day back home. Oh, I didn't right. like it out there, you know. And and then they're back here to do what, you know. And for me, I got a full scholarship to West Virginia, right. And my mentor took me down with a friend, drove me to Morgantown, you know. And we laughed and joked, helped me get in the room, and then I was looking. I was looking at her out the window as they was as they were driving away. <laughs> right? I, was like, I was like, hold on. <laughs> I need to go back to Egypt. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I got downstairs, I ran to the McDonald's, right? And I got on the pay phone. I called my mom collect. I said, Ma, this ain't working. I'm coming home. She said, You no longer have a room here. <laughs> like that. I was like, what? <laughs> Well, so you're ready to come home as well, huh? Yeah, man, I was getting out of there, man. <laughs> she said, "You don't have, a, you no longer have a room here." I was like, "What?" Right. Yeah, your brother's in that room. <laughs> <laughs> you need interventions uh, in your life. You need them. You do. You do. I mean, hey, if you know what, if it was easy, everybody could do it. Right. Absolutely. You know, so it ain't easy. You know what what you're dreaming about is not easy, and so how how did you um you know what I mean how did you get you know now you're going through this process of trying to find out what it is that you want to what is the dream what is the purpose 
I mean, uh, how, how did it, you know, how did you arrive at? Well, I think I was fortunate. I think that the person who was in charge of the program was African-American man. He kind of played a father figure in my life, kind of started teaching me about black history, to be quite honest with you, um, during that mm -hmm. summer and the first year. So that was a motivating factor. Then I started to believe that I can achieve whatever I wanted to achieve. But I think one of the things I realized that kept me going, and I would say from that point up until this point in life, I always believe I have to outwork everybody. But it was two poems. It was one by Frederick Douglass that talks about if there's no struggle, there's no progress. And that quote kind of taught me that I had to give myself grace because this after my aunt hung up, I said, this is going to be hard. It's going to be painful. Um, and I got to give myself grace and be patient with myself along the way because it's going to hurt. And then there's another poem that talk about written by Longfellow that talks about the height reach and kept by great men would not attain by sudden flight, but they, while their companions slept, were tolling up during the night. So that just means you have to outwork people. So I mm -hmm. kind of just couple those together when I was at Hofstra and said, it's going to hurt because I'm starting out from a point of disadvantage, not dumber than anybody, but I don't have, I didn't have the resources they had. So I had to catch up. But I can catch up because I can outwork you because the average person doesn't want to work more than the maximum time required, right? If it's nine to five, mm -hmm. they want to leave at five. And if you stay into 530, you'll catch them too over time, right? So mm -hmm. that was my, the core was my, the three women in my life, my mother, my aunt, my grandmother, I had to do it. And then what got me through it is like, hey, Bruce, realizing it's going to hurt. And I, but I had to play catch up and over time I could. So as a result, I just end up doing extremely well at Hofstra to the point where they said, hey, we want you to teach uh, the students here accounting because I was an accounting major. So they said, teach okay. the entire university. So you got this black kid from the ghetto now teaching the entire university accounting. Right. So it's like, <laughs> how, how does that happen? Right. That just doesn't yeah. happen. Um, so, of course, it just instilled a whole lot of confidence in you at that point. Um, and I just carried it on my whole life. I have to outwork everybody and I'll catch people and deal with the disadvantage I started out with just by outworking and catching people over time. That was mm. throughout my entire career. And then so you end up graduating in a, with a degree in accounting? I, I graduated with a degree in accounting. I was going to work with one of the at that point. This is my age, the big eight accounting firms. And that is the big four, Arthur Anderson and the sister who was a recruiter, essentially said, OK, this is the package, Bruce. Intervention again. She said, this is the package. We want you to come. But she said, what do you really want? I, she looked at me and said, what do you really want to do? I said, I want to go to law school. She said, don't take this offer. So this is a recruiter telling me not mm -hmm. to take the offer, Arthur Anderson. She said, what school did you apply to? I said, Georgetown. She said, OK, I know someone. And you should go on an interview and see if you really want to go there. And I did it. And I got in. And even after I got in, and sometimes people who intervene, Lowe's, um, and sometimes people who support you, who are mentored, they don't have to look like you. In fact, a lot of people who supported me weren't African-Americans. So mm -hmm. what happened was essentially after I got into Georgetown, it was two weeks before law school was supposed to start. I said, I'm not going there. It's too far, too much money. So I went to Brooklyn Law School, spoke to the dean, a Caucasian man. He said, listen, it's two weeks before school start. We'll accept you. However, he said, I'm going to give you some advice I would give someone close to me. Don't come here. He said, go to Georgetown. I don't want you to have any regrets. Advice, right? Mm -hmm. Advice. But people are going to give you advice in life. You got to be willing to accept it. So I accepted his advice and said, I'm going. So throughout. So that's why I went to law school at Georgetown. But even through Hofstra, people were doubting how can an African-American do so well in accounting, right? So I had to deal with that. But I just use all those <laughs> doubts as motivation, right? And said, "Oh, hey, I got to prove. I got to prove to you again, you're wrong." So that's how I kind of dealt with it at Hofstra and Georgetown, right? There were doubts. How can you do so well in tax classes? I said, "Okay, here we go again. I have to prove you're wrong." So every point in my career, there was always p noise. I considered it noise, negative noise. That now I have grown to just ignore those those things. But early in my career. 
I just use it as a source of motivation. Yeah. And, and, and then, uh, you know, I, like you said, I think God puts people in our place, in a place oh, for you to say something. And, uh, you know, again, you, you, it's a choice. I mean, yep. I mean, he, he's telling you it and, and, and here, here's selflessness for him because he works there. Yeah. You know, he, 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 he works there and he, he could have said, I'm, I'm sending money, you know, <laughs> talent someplace else. And, and, uh, and, and then, you know, he said, look, and it's like, I had a kid, <laughs> which I, I was coaching at Albany state university. And I went to see a kid in Mayor pack six, seven brother in, in Mayor pack. And I'm in a division three school. I seen this kid play, man. I was like, oh my God, this guy could play. I mean, he literally could play. Right. And and I'm a former NBA player. So I got persuasive skills, you know, and 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 Albany State University was a very good school. And if you were looking at just school, right? right. It was a very good school. And and I ended up uh he I asked him what he wanted to, what he wanted to actually do. He said he wanted to be a doctor. You know, so I said, Oh, so called uh you know a friend of mine that was at uh Norfolk State mm -hmm. and I said I got a kid up here you need to see and uh he went there right my wife says I think his name was Jerome Moore yeah I don't I, I know it was Jerome but I don't know what his last name was but he ended up going to there and he ended up becoming a doctor so Incredible. I mean the thing is but he could have went with me and I would have been like the kind of the guy at Albany State, <laughs> Albany right. State University, you know, but you know, what was bigger to see what was bigger, you know, in that person and what was most important for that person is, is important. And sometimes people like you said, right. Sometimes people have to learn the balance between um, understanding history, our history, particularly. Absolutely. Right. Understanding our history, but understanding, too, that there are a lot of good people out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Regardless of color, regardless of culture yep. Yep. that. But we'll get caught up all the way on the black side where we won't listen to no other culture because they're not black. Yeah, on that right? note, let me say something to you, Lowe's. One of the things I'm advocating now that diversity and inclusion. And I tell people that we should keep our foot on the accelerator for those who are currently in power, Caucasian men, and keep mm -hmm. putting the pressure on them because we have to. Uh, however, what we tend to do as a people, we get past to each other because it, oftentimes I can go to an organization that's being run by a women or minority and their leadership team reflects the same leadership team that their Caucasian men leadership team reflects. It looks just like it. And what we tend to do is give each other a pass. I think that we don't do as much as we should do. Now, don't get Bruce Jackson wrong. Keep putting the pressure on Caucasian men. But let's look at what we're doing. And oftentimes we fall short. Right. In terms of are we hiring as many African-Americans as we can hire when we're in a position of doing it. And when sometimes I see it and sometimes I don't. And I think we need to call it out because everyone has a responsibility. Right. And oftentimes mm -hmm. my philosophy is why don't we do it? And we can show the rest of the world how it's supposed to be done. But when we don't do it, that's what I'm saddened by the whole process. I think the system, and you hear me refer to the system kind of has worked, right? We don't go mm -hmm. back to our communities. We're taught not to go back. Sometimes we don't hire as many in our communities as we should. We, we got to break those barriers mm -hmm. and, and discuss it, right? Publicly. Oh yeah, definitely. Without a doubt. Um, and I think this is an off track question, but it just popped in my head. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Yeah, uh, it just popped in my head. And um, why why do you think that um, sometimes we can get we can take control as African-American people? Mm -hmm. Right. We can finally take control and and then not be as productive you know, in our execution. There's really no excuse for it. I think we just got to make sure that we're, we're doing it for the people, right? Um, if you're doing it for the people, I think 
there's no excuse for you not to be able to execute because you want to hire the right people. I think mm-hmm. you're right. Sometimes you see that we have it, but not in corporate America. You typically see a lot of it in government, right? In corporate America, mm-hmm. what I see is we're executing, but we're not executing with our people. And that's the frustration. I think in other situations, when we have control, I think it's on us to execute and hold everyone accountable and try to rally around and support one another as opposed to fighting one another. I think it's about rallying and supporting each other because we can get it done. And it's not about we talked about selfishness, like you said, with that basketball player, what you did was say, hey, listen, this is better for you. And to me, you got your blessings as a you got more blessings as a result of that, as opposed to having them come play for you, if you ask right. me. Um, so, oh, yeah, so, I think, so I think it's about being selfish, selflessness, right? And basically trying to do something for the organization that we're a part of. And we need to learn how to support each other as opposed to trying to chop each other down, right? And, and we got to be right. willing to accept critical feedback. If we're not doing the right thing because that's how you grow with feedback and we don't sometimes we don't like to accept feedback yeah and i one one more point i like to make is that when i when i became the executive director of the boys and girls club in mount vernon right i i remember it wasn't many of us when you Mm -hmm. when you look at the the boys and girls club movement right most of the people that uh, worked in in boys and girls clubs were uh, part time workers, right? Whether whether they be unit directors or program people, uh, it wasn't a whole lot of African American people in administrative positions. So I was one, and you know, when you talk about three or four thousand boys and girls club, mm-hmm. there wasn't many of us who were executive directors. Right. And I remember going to my first conference and meeting Lou Dantzler, who was the executive director of the Challengers Boys and Girls Club in L.A. And we had a private meeting. I mean, every time every where national conference we went, to, we always had a private meeting where we meet in what we call the dean's room, which was, Lou. Right. you know, he started Boys and Challengers Boys and Girls Club out of the back of his truck with 12 kids turn into a, a membership of 3000 right wow. and, and and i mean one of the worst parts of la and and so the dean would come in and they called soap the society of african american professionals and we used to meet in his room and you know the thing i liked about it was he was talking to a few it's everybody all the part time workers everybody and the thing I really liked about what was being said was that this is not a meeting where we just come in and say, we're going to fight for you, you know, as African-American people to become more administrators, more executive directors, so forth and so on. Right. We're going to fight for you. Right. But we're not going to give you it. Right. right? We, the national had great training. He said, now you need to get trained because we're not just putting course you african-american we're not just putting you in right. as executive directors without being trained so they they pushed the boys and girls clubs of america to put us in training programs so that we would learn how to be unit directors and marketing directors yeah. and yeah and administrators and and that's what i liked about it is that we weren't hand any handed anything without being qualified See, we have right. a tendency, man, we want to put people in stuff because they're our friends and, and they're not qualified to do the work. Right, right, right. Right. So you got to be qualified or credentials to get into the business. No, no, no. So, I think you're right. I think we should be qualified. I would say this, though. The caveat would be definitely qualified, but let's be mindful of how other things work. A lot of discussions I have around corporate America, and I'm pivoting to corporate America, is when it comes to women and minorities, right? First of all, the lack of diversity in corporate America is is poor, right? It hasn't Mm -hmm. really moved that much in 20 years. Um, And then when you talk about women and minorities getting promoted, what has to happen, and I like to say they have to be buttoned up, and you may say what's buttoned up, typically, when they promote mm-hmm. a women and minority in corporate America, all the eyes have to be 
dotted, all the T's crossed, and they have to be in a position for a period of time. This, this, I'm just illustrating the inequities that exist in corporate America. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to a Caucasian man, typically in corporate America, they promote them based on potential. Mm -hmm. And so what I try to tell corporate America, I like that standard based on potential, but let's apply that uniformly to everyone in mm -hmm. corporate America, right? Because there's a different standard in terms of promotion, right? And it's a different standard in terms of hiring, really, to be honest with you. So that's just corporate America, but I understand your point. Whenever we're in a position, we have to hold everyone to equal standards, right? Because it's right. important for the person at the top to make sure things go well, because that will benefit that person. So that person can be in a position to even hire more qualified people. And then the outcome would be better if you have qualified people in any organization. Right. And I like what you said about the potential, because you could you have to, you know, you have to see that potential and then say, OK, this is what you can do to reach that potential. Yep. Right. And give opportunity. I'm going to give you an opportunity. Yep, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And then but we are limited in that. Yep, we're you limited. Know, we don't now, really get yeah, we're like, okay, man, you you don't have this, you don't have this, you don't have this. Bingo, right. bingo, that's it. Yep. <laughs> so, but somebody else, you like, okay, well, he got potential, so we're gonna move him over here, and then we, you know, we're gonna give him experience here. We're gonna get training over, here. and that's what I think Lou was talking about to to the national is for mm -hmm. us as African American people to have those same qualities, equalities equities yep. you yep. know to have the same training that you're giving yep. everybody else absolutely that's yeah. exactly right yeah yeah and 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 so you you go on how did you i mean you you go on you get you get into uh you're in law school um and mm -hmm. was it tough uh i think the first year was tough right because it's new it's a new language right and it's not like mm -hmm. it's not the conversation we had around my table right like about <laughs> different legal principles um, so some people had an advantage because they heard some of the language. So it was tough. Right. The first year was tough. But second and third year, at that point, you know what it took to really get through it. And yeah. I end up taking more tax courses than anyone because at that point, my passion was tax law. OK. I mean, then how do you get to from, uh, you know, you in tax law and how do you get into music law? Well, one of the things my book is, is going to be revealed <laughs> early, early in life. What I wanted to do is be on Broadway. I want to be on Broadway. So okay. when we yeah, play yeah. basketball around the way, I used to sneak away and tell them my friends, I'm going to go visit my grandmother. And I would take acting, singing and dance lessons. You couldn't do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you could be the kid who was doing that in the projects and be truthful about uh, it. Oh, no, nah, man. You doing what? You going where? You're going where you're putting on some some tights or whatever. So you can't, you can't be that you can't be that guy. So I never told anyone. So reading the book, they're gonna find out for the first time some 50 years later, right? So my passion for entertainment has been that. So I I decided not to do it only because, and this is a message I tell kids. I didn't believe in myself because it, after high school, a lot of people were saying pursue the arts. And I said, I can't do that because I can't afford to fail. I have to do something where there's more guarantee that I would have success. And, and what I saw was people working as a bartender or waiters or waitresses in restaurants who were in the arts. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's so important. You, what you see is what you believe. So I didn't believe in myself, nor did I bet in myself. So I tell kids now, believe and bet on yourself and don't measure yourself up against someone's failure. Mm. So what I did, I looked at other people's failure and said, I can't do it. So that's not what you do. So I tell kids, don't do that. Just because someone else right. failed doesn't mean that you're going to be a failure. So if you believe in yourself and you're passionate about something, pursue it and bet on yourself. And I didn't. So my interests for the entertainment became, okay, since I didn't pursue my career or passion, now I can represent entertainment attorneys. And one of my first clients was Pete Rock, who grew up in Mount Vernon. Yeah. Right? yeah. Pete Rock uh -huh. and Sue right. 
And his family was pretty deliberate that they wanted to have someone at that point, an African-American representative. I mean, they said it made it clear. They said, hey, we're not raising our kids to 18 and passing them to someone else. Um, can you do it, Bruce? And I said, yeah, I can do it. I think I'll do a great job. at it. And I did. Right. And then it, from there, it went on from Pete Rock. From there, it went on to Pete Rock, CL, MC Light, Heavy D, LL, Busta. In the 90s was just a fantastic time for us. <laughs> so was you was getting it. You was getting it another way. It's almost like not getting on the court, on the court and playing, but now right. I'm coaching. A or absolutely. Now that's, that's how I game, got right? it. But not everyone <laughs> know. Not everyone knew I was getting it right, except me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did you ever think like, hey, maybe maybe I throw some, a track down there too? You know. No, I didn't do that, but it, it certainly <laughs> felt good, right? It certainly felt good. Wanted to do something like that. It was as close as I was going to get at that point. But that was just my way of kind of living my dream as well. Right. And so you, I mean, and so now you, you know, you, you're doing that. You ha you have your own company by this time. I mean, I have I mean, my own law firm at that point. Yep, have my own law firm. I mean, how was that? Um, I think it was. I think initially it was challenging, only because. Let's be honest. I'm pretty candid. Black folks didn't really hire black folks back then. We had a lot of entertainers, a lot of athletes, um, but they weren't hiring black folks. So I was fortunate. Um, to run across, still not. <laughs> and, and still not to the degree we should. Right. And I was fortunate mm -hmm. however, to run across the, the Phillips family, Pete's family, where they were kind of committed to that. Right. And then once I got someone like Pete, come on, you got everyone else. So he made it easy for me. In fact, I talked to Pete every now and then and when I talk to him, I thank him for me being where I am today because he wasn't that mm. much younger than me, but he trusted his career with me. And I thank him. I said, had it not been for you, I wouldn't be where I am today. So thank you. Right. Yeah. 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 You, sh you, you give him that uh, appreciation. You know, oh, I, oh, no for, question uh, about it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, was, was, the, it, was one of the biggest producers at, at that time. Think about it. It was Pete Rock or Dr. Dre. Who was number one? It, it was, right. was that popular at that point in time and everyone wanted to represent him. Yeah. And I remember them. I, I wasn't a big, you know, rap guy, but I remember, uh, you know, their tune ups were sometime in the boys and girls club doing the, you know, doing the parties, man. Right. Right. You know, at, right. At the, at the South side, at the South side club. <laughs> yeah. And yep. uh, yeah, no, it was, I mean, then were good times, man. I mean, yeah, music was good. You know, everybody was having a good time. Um, yeah, yeah, you had some amazing, some amazing people. What do you, what do you think about had in in your mind being in that industry? Yeah, and it was tough, right? Because mm -hmm. I, I was looking at some of the things you you were talking about about the industry uh, at that time. Has the in industry gotten better in regards to? the the entertainer the uh do you think it's gotten better or worse i, I think from an entertainment standpoint even from an athletic standpoint they're smarter right and, and they're mm -hmm. thinking the way they should think we need to get more of them to think that way in terms of ownership in terms of starting their own business um but i think they're in a better place than they were in the past but not where we should be totally today but i think there's growth there's no question about it on both sides right. i think when we had ll we we're able to get ll to own his master recordings in the 90s at that point no one really very few people own their master recordings now it's part of the whole dialogue people are owning their master recordings so there's some growth in the industry and some people are setting up their own entertainment entities so i think there's growth but we still have a long way to go right and i think we have to start yeah. empowering each other i don't see that as much as it should happen, right? Even today, in terms of African Americans hiring African Americans. One of the things we talk about, we talk about equity. You'll hear people saying, well, we need to provide opportunities to train people to be doctors, these young kids, train them to be accountants and business managers. I'm like, okay, and you have Black people saying that, and they're donating to these organizations that's providing the training. And my question to them would be, well, there are a lot of black accountants, business managers, and lawyers and doctors now. Are you using their services today? So start using their services today, right? 
And certainly let's provide resources and train the next generation. But why are you not employing them today? Because once they're trained, they're going to need opportunities. And so are you mm -hmm. going to provide opportunities for them? And if you're not doing it today, what makes me think you're going to do it tomorrow for the next generation that you're providing all these resources for? Yeah. Again, I'm, I, I may sound like I'm coming down, but I think we have to do better. No, we, well, you know, I, I have these conversations all the time, right? Because what, what happens to us, we just become islands. Yeah. Right. So I'm doing it over here. That person is doing it over there. And we all on an island. Yeah. We're on our own islands. And, and then, but there's no power in the island. No, there is. You know, no, the power is that you still maintaining what it is you can do on your island, but connecting with the other islands because the resource pooling of resources is going to make you more powerful. I would right? agree with that. And, yeah. and, and then, and then if, if, you know, if I, if I came up and, and I was like, yeah, hey, yeah, I'm a great player, man. I made it to the NBA, so forth and so on. And, and I just went about my way, right? But I never turned around and said, hey, to a young person, hey, let me, let me show you, avoid some of these obstacles that, you know, I've been through. Let me Absolutely. let me take you through that, right? And and I always say that, I'm, you know, we're always looking for the next, uh, you know, every day looking for the next Denzel Washington. You mm -hmm. know, we... We, we we need to find out where they are, male or female. We need to find out where they are. We need to develop them. We need to, you know, help them reach their full potential, put them in our camp. Because yep. as, as African-American, they should be in our camp. They should be loyal, right? And we should, you know, they should be loyal to us. And when it comes time to getting representation, they, they, hey, here you go. You need a lawyer. They, boop, there you go. You know, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, and I don't see that, honestly. You know, I don't I don't see a lot of a lot of the partnerships, um, you know, working together, you know. So, uh, yeah, that's tough. No, it is. It is. I think it'll get better. I mean, it, it'll get better eventually. We're just not there. But I think we have to whenever you're trying to come up with a solution to a problem, you have to highlight the issue. And then you mm. work your way to a solution for it. And, and so you have to just highlight that and let people know it's out there. Uh, and people, right. and we need to start talking about it, right? Others are right. talking about it, but we need to start talking about it, right? So you you start your own, you know, entertainment lawyer business, and and then you're in it. You you're doing your thing, and all of a sudden, what happens? Um, what happens? What I try to tell young kids, I say young to young kids uh, and and business people, I said you have to treat your career like a business, all right? You have right. to look at the industry you're in, look at where it was, where it is today, and where it's going. Microsoft does that, right? We always look, okay, where is it going? We need to get there first. So with your career, you need to do the same thing. So what happened with me, you hear the word digital transformation all the time now. Mm -hmm. Everyone does. And I tell people digital transformation for the music industry took place in 2000. And they say, what do you mean? I say, well, before 2000, we had physical distribution albums that's what people consume music with uh, using albums then you had napster came along napster made it digital people start consuming digitally and so at that point i saw that the industry was changing to be quite honest with you and i said it's probably a good time for me to go work for a technology company it's strategic for one two years at most microsoft and come back and i'll have a competitive advantage in the marketplace so that was my goal. Go to Microsoft one or two years, understand this technology thing and come back. And I would know more about technology and the new movement of distribution of music than anyone in the music industry. And when I decided to come back, the music industry was turned upside down because they didn't embrace technology, the digital transformation. Mm -hmm. um, and so and they didn't for years. Right. For years, they did not. Right. They didn't come up with a business model for that new distribution. And so I decided to stay where I was, which is at Microsoft. Hmm. But that's the reason for the move. It was strategic move. Right. And I yeah. Clarence Avon too, one of my advisors, and he said, Bruce, go do it. 
<laughs> and you just did it. You said, okay. And I said, let's just do it because I can always come back, right? So it can't hurt me to go out and work at that point for Microsoft for two years. It couldn't hurt my resume. They were one of the top technology companies in the world at that point. So yeah. it wouldn't hurt me at all. We have to learn to take risks too as you know, you got to teach us people, your kids, our gen, next generation, that it's okay to take risks and accept risk. And and so now you you you've been in my Microsoft for a little while now, man. Yeah, I've been here for uh, twenty three years, but I was going to leave probably twenty years ago. We talked about Seattle at one point, you and I. So I started in Seattle. So I left New York mm. and came to Seattle. And I decided after about two years, I spoke to the vice chairman. He's the vice chairman now who I have a good relationship with. And I said, I'm leaving. He said, why are you leaving? I said, there are no black people at Microsoft. There are no black people in Seattle. And I'm going back and I'm not negotiating. And at that point, he said, you, you know, you're willing to leave because lack of diversity. I said, absolutely. And he said, let's see if we can find some. He said, I understand. That's that's the first thing you got. He said, I understand. Let's see if we can find something for you back in New York. And he did. And that's the reason I'm here 21 years after I was about to leave. Hmm. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> that, that yeah you have to be happy where you are. Right. Ultimately, that's my philosophy. Yeah. And, and, and so, uh, 20, what, 23 years, 23 years, yeah. 23 years now. Um, so talk a little bit about Microsoft and that whole, you know, uh, experience there and and how if you're looking at if people looking at Microsoft, because hey, like you said, everything thing, everything is yesterday. I mean, yep. you know, I mean, you know, Microsoft's not living in yesterday. They living in the future. Yeah, so Microsoft is <laughs> Microsoft. You have to in order for us to be relevant, we have to live in the future or be ahead of everyone else and just certainly i think from a microsoft standpoint now everyone went to digital transformation right moving your environment from on prem your on premise to the cloud and now people are starting to look at ai which is going to be something that's going to be infused in everything that we do um but i think and i was able at microsoft to close billion dollar deals, $10 billion deals. So I've been able to close huge deals. And it certainly is a great adrenaline rush when I get to do that. Um, however, I think one of the things that I did that I'm probably just as proud about, we had a, I was manager of $20 billion team. And I try to use this by way of example only. It was a $20 billion team. And my team was made up of 15 women of which seven were African Americans. We had seven, three African-American males, two Asian males, two Latino males, and then we had two Caucasian males. Um, so extremely diverse team that was supporting a $20 billion business, not just internally from Microsoft, but externally, people don't see that. Um, the message that my team wanted to send was, hey, listen, you could have a diverse team like this stacked up against a $20 billion business, which was larger than most Fortune 500 companies. Mm. Most Fortune 500 companies are not at $20 billion. Um, so that was the message. And I think even one of my leads, a Caucasian male in Fargo, his team was made up of four African Americans. And, and the reason we did all that, and it wasn't to exclude anyone, it's about really including people who otherwise would not have an opportunity to be included. Right. To the party. And it was creating a culture. And what we did essentially was said every interview slate that we had, we're going to make sure there's a woman and a minority on that slate. And they all have a great opportunity or equal opportunity to get a job. Um, and that's what we did. So I didn't really participate in the decision making of the hiring of the team, but I kind of established a culture and the parameters in terms of how we're going to interview people. Um, so I think it's important for us to just and that was to help Microsoft too at the end of the day, right? That sort of diversity helped Microsoft with its diversity numbers. And it's just to show people that it can be done if people are intentional and deliberate about that. The question is, when we talk about diversity, it should be more about intentional diversity. Right. And, and if people are deliberate, you can achieve those type of results. It's just the lack of intentions, if you ask. Yeah. 
And yeah, I think it's, you know, some of the examples is that we've been able to do those things as far as sports are concerned. Yep. Yep. And, and, and gotten better as far as, um, particularly in the acting, we've started to get more diverse in, in some, in, in regards to, uh, sports and, and, and now journalists and announcers, particularly, we starting to see this transformation as well. Um, but when it comes to uh, corporate and ownership, uh, ownership of NBA teams, uh, ownership of NFL teams, baseball right. teams, right? You 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 see that that hasn't that what you're talking about hasn't entered. No, not ownership of the teams. Not it hasn't. I, I think it will at some point, but it hasn't. But it has to be a more of a collaborative effort. Um, of like you said, people have to cooperate and work together to make something yeah. like that happen. Yeah, I'm, and Victor just said hello. Do you see that down there? <laughs> yeah, I did. Hello, Victor. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, and and what would be your, you know, dealing with this whole thing or issue of uh, of divi- of diversity? Um, I mean, what what do you think that needs to be done that we need to do to? Um, now that in the future we could play this at this next level i i I think one one of the things i'll say particularly i can speak on from a corporate standpoint i think whenever when we examine where we are over a period of years we realize we've been pretty flat there's been some progress um but there's still lots more that needs to be made and what you tend to see whenever companies want to analyze where they are they'll say let's draft a white paper let's let's figure this out with let's figure it out let's figure out let's draft a white paper and i'm like we have some of the smartest people in the world solving some of the most difficult challenges in the world but we can't get this thing called diversity right hmm. and now you want to look at or have someone draft another white paper to find out why you're not achieving your goals and diversity and inclusion i'm like we've been doing that for years my philosophy now is Women and minorities are out there. Let's just hire them like we hire everybody else. Let's just hire them at this point. And in addition to that, what we talked about early, when we talk about promoting them, let's promote women and minority based on potential. And if we do those two things, um, then you start to see progress. And in addition to that, what I'm advocating is that when people have scorecards, when they want to evaluate employees They also have a diversity and inclusion part of the evaluation process. Hmm. My philosophy, let's separate that. Let's have the evaluation process, the general evaluation. Let's evaluate them on diversity and inclusion. Let's tie money to each of those things. And when you tie money to stuff, people (laughs) will act accordingly, right? That's that's right. But when you lump it all in one thing, the person may not be doing anything for diversity and inclusion, but they're still compensated well. But when you mm-hmm. carve it out and they see what they're ri- at risk of losing or gaining, then you would kind of dictate behavior. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, and and has and you know, in all this, you know, because when we when we are trying to achieve our goals and we're trying to be successful, um, have there you know, it, and I think of, I read some challenging, some challenges around family, right? Uh, you know, when you're going for your dream, man, there's always right. challenges. So has there been any challenges in regards to growing family and, you know? No, no, I, I think I, I take full accountability. And as I wrote the book, I just start to think more. Um, I'm probably, I've been extremely successful being focused and driven professionally. And I tell people that now openly. But I think that came with the cost, i.e. being responsible for the failed relationships, right? Um, And of with significant others, as well as, you know, not being around the kids as much as I should have, because I thought my job was just to provide resources. And I later conclude that your significant other needs to be nurtured like your kids need to be nurtured. Kids want daddy, right? Mm-hmm. Not just the resources that are necessary to be successful. So in that area, I fail. I think that I'm encouraging people now because you still have to be focused and drive towards your goal. 
but you need to have that discussion with your family and let them know what you think you have to do and what would work for them as well and try to figure out a balance. It has to be a family decision, right? In my position, I just did what I thought I needed to do to be successful. Probably be more helpful for me to sit down and say, this is what I think I need to do. Is that okay with you or what would work for you? Considering I'm going for this goal and it's going to take a lot of my time. So it needs to be a family discussion when you do something like that. That's just my philosophy um, because when I look back and I look at, if I say I close a $10 billion deal, I may not know the details of those deals, um, but the memory with family, you'll, you'll remember, and you want to carry that with you, right? So mm -hmm. th that was a failure on my part. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, that's, that's challenging, man. Um, you know, every time you're going for uh, you know, you're going for a goal because for most of my life, uh, trying to be a, a professional athlete, uh, of course, took me away from, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mom and brothers and sisters and so forth and so on. And I'm in this place and I'm in that place and I'm trying to achieve the goal, you know. And so sometimes that can pull a strain, yep. you know, on 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 family um, and yeah, it could be very challenging out there. And you, but you said something that was, and you use a word, uh, you said balance. And I remember reading a book by Dr. Edwin Lewis Cole on maximized manhood. And he said that balance is the key to life. Yep. Right. And uh, communication is the basis of life. Right. Right. When you stop communicating, then. I mean, you're, you're you're probably about to go in the wrong direction. I mean, yeah. when, there, when there's no communication, right? And and so yeah, you're right about that. And, and a very key word, balance. Yep, you have to you, you have <laughs> to have that discussion so you can balance it out. <laughs> yeah, and um, let's see. Uh, I think um, um, you know, wh where do you see now when you think about the future? <laughs> it's interesting. People ask me that right now with the the book out and my response is and I'll give you the response I give them. Right. <laughs> I say, well, listen, I am where I am because God placed me here. When he lets me know where I'm going, I'll call those more and say, hey, you know what? I just got the call. <laughs> 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 I just got the call, so now I know what's next. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, yeah, that's true. You know, that, that's that's true. Um, you got to hear from him, right? You know, and um, and I know that there's probably, um, man. I just I was just thinking, man, how you know we've been through this pandemic. I mean, some people see seen the pan it, it was a tragedy without a doubt all the things oh, that no happened yeah, in regards to uh uh the pandemics social justice issues uh that happened during the pandemic man i didn't know if you can get any worse <laughs> than what no. was going on in the pandemic Absolutely. right um but it can cause you to i would say freeze yep get stuck mm -hmm. and go backwards yeah, right. And a lot of people got stuck, you know, they were frozen and start thinking going backwards instead of moving forward. Um, you know, and it's, it really it was an opportunity to reset, uh, to reset, exactly to move right. forward. Yeah. yeah. To think about future, to think about what's next and some amazing things that people don't understand. I, I guess you can see this in Microsoft in that in the in that that space some amazing things start to come out of that space. I mean, through this tragedy. Yeah, I, th I think certainly. I think from a technology standpoint, it, it did, right? I think one of the things is work from home tools that enable people to work from home was an mm -hmm. incredible tool. I think now companies kind of want people to come back, but the pandemic has some degree illustrate that people can be effective working from home with tools like that. I think technology is an enabler right i think even when i think about where we are today we're having these economic headwinds some people say a recession some people say we're not 
But one of the ways in which companies can really deal with that is through technology, right? Mm -hmm. Because technology can be used to make people more effective, to make a situation where people can do more with less, right? So oh, yeah. I think so technology is going to be an enabler. And you're going to see, like we talked about AI earlier, AI will be infused in everything that we do, right? And it will only get better over time. Yeah, and I've seen that, wow, some some people like, in person, like uh, uh, like churches. I mean, right. you know, it was in person, in person. People didn't know what they were going to do. All of a sudden, man, you you knew nothing about technology. But look, you had to, those who got in, you know, got into it, jumped into it, started using with uh, Zoom and Streamyard and absolutely and and, and YouTube. And, yep. I mean, their their churches have, you know, now they got online campuses. Uh, you know, people you know, organizational stuff started happening like that. And so technology is very much a, you know, an infused part of our future. No, there's no question about it. And that's why I try to tell kids there. I mean, I told kids to follow their passion, but I think when it comes time to, I'm somewhat biased to technology and I'm always saying, hey, listen, you may want to look at a career in technology, whether it's cybersecurity, because there's some areas you can go and get a certificate and get a job. And that's one of the things companies are looking at now, right? Do you always need to go to college from a technology standpoint? No, you can get a certificate in cybersecurity in some of these cases and make over six figures. So oh. it's giving people options. And I think people in our community should just have options and information so they can make the appropriate decisions that fit them. Well, here, here's, a, I, I, and you probably know this better than I do, but just before I uh, was retiring from the Boys and Girls Club, a company came in, you know, a uh, tech company came in and they said, look, you know, we want to develop this program here at the Boys and Girls Club in regards to training young people about technology. And they were talking about like we got right now uh, 37,000 jobs available yeah. in tech. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and they said, you know, we have no skills to work it. Right. It's true. Right. And they and they're saying like we we're, we're bringing people from other countries. That's absolutely right. Here to do technology. You know, making people making an enormous amount of money doing tech. Right. And and we can't find anybody in America to do it. So you you you're absolutely right when it comes to tech. I mean, that's where the jobs are. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, today, I mean, you know, you ought to be considering it. Right, there's right. a shortage of your workforce. You you hit it right on the head. There's a sh job shortage in terms of skill shortage um, for jobs in the tech field. There's no question about it. Yeah, and I mean, in all jobs are about skills. I mean, yeah. you, you if you can't get the skills, you know, I was telling the kids the other day in school. I said, look, man, I'm not gonna if you don't have a you know a certificate to cut hair <laughs> that you've been trained, you can't cut my hair, man. I mean, like absolutely, you know, so. I know nobody, no, no, nobody wants to go to a beautician that has no training. Yep. I mean, yep. so it's all about picking up skills because there are plenty of jobs out there. It's just a matter of getting the skills to do them. And we got to let them know when we talk about technology, it's just not sitting in a corner writing code. It could be cybersecurity. How do people break in to different environments? Learn that. It could be gaming, right? Writing games. Right. That's oh. something else as well. So it's just different areas of technology. So it's about really just informing the kids in the community about the different sort of trades that one can get and the different options that they have available to them when they make those decisions. Yeah. It's like Aaron Beasley. Uh, I had him on for the Super Bowl show. Right. And he was talking about his investment into gaming. Yeah. Gaming is huge. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a big time thing, you know. Hey, hey, most of the brothers out here, man, they ain't going to work. They playing games, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's an opportunity for the next generation of young people to create games, right? Right. And maybe yeah. take a step back from playing and say, this is what you like to play. How do we improve upon it to create our own game that people yeah. may like and sell that, right? Yeah. Well, I'm going to throw out, we're in our last few minutes here. We got about maybe 11 minutes to go. I got, I'm going to throw out some... Uh, I usually give early in the show is my word of the week, right? My, and I don't know, we're going to show some pictures here in a minute, but uh, uh, my word of the week is 
I think my my wife is there with the word of the week. Yeah, it's called B. Right? Two letters. Be worthy, be loyal, be trustworthy, be thoughtful, be wise, be valuable. And be you. Yeah, be, right? yeah, be you. And, and I mean, that's one of my favorite words Yeah. Uh, that like the that. Boys and Girls Club of America, they had a, a, a theme for a few years called Be Great. Yep. You know, be a lawyer, be a doctor, be a teacher. Be a fireman, be an entertainer, be such a powerful word, man. No, I agree. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then I got an affirmation. Yeah, I might as well throw the affirmation up there. My Hill and Pierce Harper affirmation and quote moment. Believe me, all your sacrifices, silent cries, and hard work will pay off someday. I agree. I agree with that as well. There's no, I mean, we both live that, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. We live that based yeah. on what you have to do just as an athlete and after your life as an athlete. Oh, yeah. I mean, think about that, man. Just, but you know what? People want stuff for free. They, you know, they they, they want instant. You know, they don't understand process. So, you know, and Short then uh, long term, yeah, yeah. And they, they don't want to go through the process. They don't want to put in the work. They don't put in the time. And then I got some music, right? And and some and and my movie of the week, you know, Kenny G, Roy Ayers, Herbie Hancock. Yep, yep, Ooh. yep. <laughs> <laughs> and Kenny G, God, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, man. Hey, hey, I, you know, Kenny G, you, you can't drive with Kenny G. Absolutely. You know, especially not long distance, because you you get so mellowed out, you you know, fell asleep. Absolutely. And uh, I think I got a picture, man. I I think you were with uh, Herbie Hancock, right? I was. So you must have dug that up. Yeah, that I'm a, yeah, yeah. I pulled that and, up. And man. That was uh, what was that? And Istanbul. Oh yeah, that was in Istanbul. Yeah. Ah. Yep, that was Istanbul. Yeah, there's no question about it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and uh Marcus Miller. You know, I like, you know, of course I love gospel music, but yep. um all types of gospel music, but I love jazz. Uh I mean, it's something soothing about jazz. No, man. Absolutely it is. Yeah. I mean, one time, man, they took off what's it the jazz station? What was it the, the here in New York? Uh um, they have it, they don't have it anymore. They, they used to yeah, have they brought it, it back. Really? They, they did bring because everybody was complaining because you know during your day, man, you needed something as you were driving around. You did smooth jazz. jazz, wasn't it smooth jazz? Smooth jazz, exactly. Smooth jazz, yeah, yeah. And um, and and then I, I pulled up, I think I pulled up, man. You were you've been traveling, man. So you was in Egypt. Yep. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what was that like, man? That was a great experience, only because I knew someone who knew others in the government, and so we got to travel around things escorted by government officials so it was great right we had to we had to avoid all those lines so it was a tremendous experience and i think egypt to me was my best trip just from an educational standpoint just mm -hmm. understanding the history of egypt right and right. it's people of color right so right. it was just incredible it was incredible for me i wish my kids and i want to take my kids there because i thought it was my best all-around trip from an educational standpoint <laughs> And then, um, and I think we got some more pictures. Yeah, they, oh yeah, because you've been around, man. You, what, what's next, man? You, where you going next, man? You, uh, you I'm here today in Seattle. Um, I'm gonna have a fireside chat with the vice chairman of Microsoft tomorrow about the book. Yeah, so that's what's next in less than 24 hours. So that's wow. the reason I flew here, actually. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so you you coming right back? I, mean, I should have told you to send me some. Oyster chowder. No. Well, you know what? If you if you want that, you need to send me a text and tell me where to get it <laughs> so I can get it before I leave. Oh, okay, okay. I may I may have to think about that while okay. I'm sitting up here tonight. Yeah, think you about know. it. You have yeah. until like let's say eleven o'clock tomorrow. Eleven o'clock. <laughs> yeah, Microsoft. Yep. Yeah, man. I was doing my job, man. Yeah. Nah, that was it. Not nah, definitely. 23 years at one place is a long time. 
Oh, well, I was at the club 27 years. So talk a little bit about community, man, all the community work. Because, you, you, man, you've done some amazing community work, man. I, I think there's an obligation to me. Um, I am where I am, like I told you, for a purpose. Um, I think I'm placed here to try to help other people get through barriers and obstacles and push others who are in position who are not moving fast enough to contribute. Because I think we all have an obligation to reach back and bring other people along this journey. And it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about the next generation. And so I'm passionate about making sure that if anything, we're helping the next generation move barriers out of their way and I teach them. Yeah. I, I was reading that, man. I read, you know, some, some things that were written about you and uh, written about the book, man. I like that. Everything you just said right there, right? you know, helping people move forward you know, uh, help people grow. I mean, and that's really what it's all about. I think that's why we all here, man. That's exactly right. That's exactly, which is why I got, I, I named five organizations and all my book royalties is going to five not-for-profit organizations. Okay. Not to me. Um, it's going to those organizations. One, so they can get something out of it. And two, just to amplify it from right. just a branding standpoint. Yeah. I mean, you, you want to give us the five, man? Maybe somebody out here want to donate too. Uh, Embrace Girls is one. Embrace the, Girls? The Universal Hip Hop Museum is another. Uh, Women and Minority Owned Law Firm is another. Eagle Academy in New York. That's that all boys. School. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I love that, man. Yeah, that's one. And then there's the Hip Hop Youth Summit. And basically go to the community and dealing right now with gun violence in our community. Well... Now that's another whole topic. <laughs> yeah, that's another topic. Absolutely. That's another whole topic, and us to be the kind of mentors and fathers uh, to young men. You know, that's my big pet peeve in regards to where. And you you mentioned it earlier about you, regarding your father. Yep. Right. And you know, when a kid's someplace or a kid does something. You know, look, we on we know our moms are there. Yep. Right. Question is, uh, and I showed an excerpt, uh, Denzel, uh, the guy said, Do you think we're further along than we were? And he and he said, No, we, we, we're not. You know, he said, uh, you know, I see I'm I was in Chicago and there was a, a young man called Yummy mm -hmm. and who had been murdered. He was 11 years old, young man that murdered him was 14. Okay. And now around Chicago, they call you them yummies, young disciples. Right. And the question was, where was his father? And said, so, well, his father was in prison. Well, mm -hmm. where was his father? Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, so a lot of responsibility in regards to African-American males right. and, 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 and particularly around fathers and mentors. You know, uh, today we need them more than ever. Right. And we yeah. could talk about prison reform and us going to jail and the system is functional. That's another discussion we could talk about as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Without a doubt, man. <laughs> <laughs> man, I, I, I want, man, because we used to talk all the time, you know. Right, and definitely. And, yeah, yep. we, we used to talk so much, you know, all the time. And uh, I want to thank you for, you know, coming on, man, spending some time with me, man. And, uh, Man, I wish you much, much success. You know, I'm, I got my again, I got my book over here, you know, never far from home. Bruce Jackson. I and appreciate you. Yeah. When you get when you get back, I'll make a special visit. Yeah. Let me know. <laughs> you know so, uh, you know, we we I can get my copy signed and your guys go out there. Yeah, nah, definitely. Yeah. Without a doubt, man. And um, yeah, you you're amazing, man. And and, and thanks, man, uh, for coming on. Um, enjoy Seattle, right? I want to reach out. I got some precious, real quickly, some precious memories. Um, we lost a good friend, uh, my teammate from way back at the boys' club, Northside Boys' Club, uh, really? the Sonics, Gary Beeson Red. Uh, we lost him the other day, man. Sorry to hear uh, that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, great, great guy, man. We we like brothers, man. We we go so far back, but 
he's going to, I miss him already because he's called me all the time or stopped by the office. And uh, yeah, yeah, man, we, we, we truly admire each other. Um, he, he lived in Mount Vernon? Uh, yes, he lived in Mount Vernon. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And uh, he just recently passed. And then uh, I want to say happy birthday to my oldest daughter, Michelle. Tell uh, Michelle happy birthday. Yeah, happy birthday, Michelle. And then, yeah, that, there's Michelle. Woo. <laughs> and then <laughs> happy birthday to my niece, Joya. Right. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, Joya. Yeah, at least a little crew. Yeah. Oh, happy birthday to Calvin. Yeah, my brother-in-law. We were just in North Carolina together. Had a great time. Hey, Cal. Yeah, we probably ate too much food. So I was <laughs> no, I'm definitely going to come up to Mount Vernon. Definitely. If not next week, um, the week after. Maybe th maybe this week I'll be up there. I'll let you know. Oh, yeah. Give me a holler. I'll yeah. definitely do that. All and right. Go grab something. Yes, sir. Uh, go, to, go to Pinkberry, maybe. <laughs> My wife's going to be in. You better make it Thursday. <laughs> so she can be here. Okay. <laughs> I go without her. She said, "You went to Pink Berry without me. I didn't get paid." <laughs> yeah, I'll keep that in mind. Yeah. <laughs> right. You already know <laughs> Pink Berry. Yes. <laughs> so Bruce, thanks, man. I'm about to close out now. Right, thank you. Yeah, man. Um, and and thank you out there for your support each and every week, man. Of the of the blueprint podcast, man. I love you guys. Look forward to seeing you next week. And remember, I say this every week, right? If God blesses you to wake up tomorrow, right? Make it your masterpiece. I love you and God bless you and see you later. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Lowe's more the blueprint podcast. Stay connected and follow us at our website, www.lowesmore.com. That's L-O-W-E-S-M-O-O-R-E dot com. You can also join the discussion on Twitter at Lowe's Moore and on Facebook at Lowe's Moore Jr. As always, thank you for pushing your mindset towards a better reality. This concludes the most thought-provoking portion of your day. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this podcast to stay fully up to date with everything we're up to. Until next time, be kind to yourself and each other. With the is a joke, I ain't buying it like I'm broke. Insufficient punch for insignificant tone.